please bring your hands together for a warm Philadelphia welcome for Robert F. Kennedy Jr. All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And welcome, Mr. Kennedy, to Philadelphia. Thank you. So um, I don't know if any of you have had an opportunity to take a look at the book yet, but the title is American Values, Lessons I Learned from my family, and as I read the book, it struck me as part history book, part autobiography, and uh, I wonder why you chose to write this book, and why now? I, I actually, excuse my voice, which should actually get better as I, as I speak, but um, I was, I started out writing this book 10 years ago, I wrote most of it, probably 70% of it, in the first year, and then I put it down for 10 years, and I wrote three other books, and then my publisher got angry at me. <laughs> and I, I wrote it, but I, the project evolved. Originally, Tim Duggan of, of HarperCollins asked me to do, he had heard me talk about wilderness expeditions that I'd gone on with my father who taught us uh, to kayak when we were very young and took us on all the big western whitewater rivers, the salmon, the snake, the yamp, the green, the Colorado, um, et cetera, and mountain climbing and, and a lot of other, and he asked me to do a book on that. And I, the project kind of evolved where I was originally writing something of a, of a memoir and, and I, um, I, was, I, I ended up writing a book, really, that is targeted for my children and for their cousins. I have seven kids, and I have 105 Kennedy cousins who are, um, who are, the, who are the progeny of the 29 grandchildren of Joseph and Rose Kennedy, with whom I was raised essentially communally on the, on the Cape, and we were... Um, you know, we were raised in a compound where all the different, the nine families had houses, and each of us moved to a different home every night for dinner, and we were all coached by a, um, by a former Olympic diver named Sandy Eiler, who my grandfather had hired to teach us different sports, for boxing and, you know, sailing and, and swimming, et cetera. And, um, and then, you know, during the White House years, it was, uh, it, the, at compound was the summer White House, and the helicopters would land every Friday on, uh, on the football field right next to the ocean. Three helicopters would land, and my uncles would get off. I look at President Kennedy, my father, uh, Teddy, who was then in the Senate, my uncle Steve Smith, who was the chief of the staff at the White House, and my uncle Sarge Driver, who was running the Peace Corps, along with a lot of different house guests. Thank you. And um, and then you know the week, and they'd spend the weekend, and the government would essentially be run from that house. And there were just a wonderful array of people that I describe in the book who spent the weekends. My my grandfather had been in the uh, film business. He, incidentally, was never a bootlegger. I explain how that got started. <laughs> that was a CIA slander that first uh, um, uh, surfaced in the mid-60s after President Kennedy's death, but, you know, it was just not true. And, um, and uh, but he had a movie theater at his house and could get first-run films, and so, you know, we had these, we had really extraordinary weekends um, and weeks uh, during, the, during the summer, and a lot of it is yeah. about, a lot of the book is kind of about what happened, and, and, and um, Hickory Hill, where I lived during the wintertime, was, was a satellite White House where many of the great Battles of the day, the civil rights movement, the integration by James Meredith of Ole Miss, um, the civil rights battles against George Wallace, the Bay of Pigs, the, um, and the Cuban Missile Crisis. It became a command center, so we were all in the midst of that. 
And, um, and that, you know, that's kind of the backdrop, the memoir part of the story. The thread that kind of connects the whole story, that links it, is, is uh, this tension that existed between my family and the CIA that began in the early 1950s um, and, and was a battle between Alan Dulles, my uncle, John Kennedy, who visited Vietnam in 1951 and gave this extraordinary speech about Africa for the Africans and um, in the Mideast for, should be ruled by local people in 1956 that pitted him against the Dulles brothers and, um, and both the liberal and conservative establishment. And my uncle, or my grandfather, Joseph Kennedy, who sat on a commission in the 1950s, which rec recommended abolishing the clandestine services of the CIA, which Dulles had created without any congressional authorization, and which was then engaged in uh, you know, fixing elections, assassinating leaders, um, overthrowing governments, uh, uh, installing dictatorships around the world, all of those legacies we're living with in the world that was created by those activities today. And my grandfather said at that time, and said even before that, that imperialism abroad is inconsistent with democracy at home. You cannot have those two things. If you're going to have an imperium abroad, you're going to end up with a national security state at home, which is what we're living with today. My father, just a week before his death, when he pulled ahead in the California primaries and was realizing that there was a good chance he was going to end up in the White House, began talking to his aides. And one of the first things he said when he, was going to get, when he got into the White House was to, to remove the clandestine services from the CIA and to stop the, you know, the, the mischief that they were creating around the world. Well, I was going to save this question for a little bit further in the interview. However, since you brought up the CIA, as I read the book, it was there's no secret that the relationship between your family and the CIA was a relationship that was fraught, you might say. Um, in fact, you write that your father, when JFK was killed, immediately suspected CIA involvement. Um, I noticed in the book, as I read about your father's assassination, the name of his assassin is not mentioned in the book. And with all of that in mind, I wonder, are you satisfied with the official version of those events, or do you think of them differently? Oh, I don't think the, I never believed the official version of the orthodox version of, the, of my uncle's assassination, and I don't think most people do. Um, I don't, you know, I think, in fact, the United States Congress, which did a, a, a two and a half year investigation, you know, the Warren Commission had been, was operating with very, very little knowledge and with an agenda, which uh, President Johnson did not want to get in a, in, a, in a situation where he suspected that Castro had been involved in my uncle's assassination, and he did not want to be in a position where he had to go to war with Castro. So he wanted a very quick resolution with a single shooter, and he made that very clear. The Warren Commission had none of its own investigators. It had it relied on the CIA and the FBI, which were, um, and you know, Alan Dulles, who my uncle had fired, was the head of the Warren Commission. And they, we now know, he was the effective head. He was, you know, Earl Warren was the titular head, but Alan Dulles really ran the Warren Commission and, um, and fed, spoon-fed information. And even the CIA now admits that they lied and that they hid information. We're still trying to get information from them about what happened. But, um, so, and that was in 63, 64, but um, in the early 70s, the Church Commission and the House Select Committee on Assassinations concluded that there had been a conspiracy, that there had been multiple assassins. Oh, and they were operating with a much broader array of information, and they were able to penetrate the CIA and at least question them. And so I don't think anybody who seriously looks at it is going to say that 
you know, Lee Harvey Oswald was the sole assassin of President Kennedy, and my father did not believe that. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about uh, the civil rights movement, because you mentioned that just a few minutes ago uh, when you talked about James Meredith, and certainly your father, your uncle, uncles, your Uncle Ted as well, um, each played a role to varying degrees in ultimately bringing about uh, the Civil Rights Act. And I wonder what you think your father would make uh, of the racial division that we see in our nation now, 60 plus years after all of that took place. Well, I think, I, I mean, uh, I think my, my father would be happy that we had a, a first black president in this country. Oh. I mean, if you, it, I, I would say my father, you know, and I, I, don't, I don't really like to say what my father would have believed if he was alive today. And I have to say this, that I think he would be disappointed in the direction that this country is going today. And that, um, uh, you know, I, I don't, this, the book is not about President Trump, but I think, you know, the, the um, one of the, my father and my uncle really believed that America was an exemplary nation, which meant that we should model democracy and that we should spend our time perfecting the union. The, the, the way to bring democracy to the rest of the world was not to force it on people at gunpoint. They know the difference. Everybody knows the difference between leadership and bullying. And that the way to spread and pro promulgate democracy was to perfect ourselves at home and make people think that you know, this was uh, a system that they envied. And in fact, that's how America had operated from the beginning. In, seven, in 1780, we were the first democracy, the only democracy in the world. By 1865, there were six. Um, by, you know, um, by the time my father was alive, and there was a huge cascade at that time because the colonial empires were breaking apart, but by the time he died, there was 160. Uh, the American system, by modeling our system, had to spread across the globe. And I think, you know, one of the, the uh, sort of confusing thing to people is whether our job is to go abroad looking, as John Adams said, for monsters to slay. Um, and that when we do that, we actually strengthen our opponents. Um, that, you know, my uncle believed he did not believe that communism was monolithic. He thought that Castro had an absolute right to experiment with Marxism in Cuba. If that's what the Cuban people wanted, you know, that it was up to them to change it. It was not up to the United States. He, um, you know, he was, he, uh, he extended American aid to communist countries to, uh, to, uh, to Yugoslavia, to Tito, and to uh, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, but South Guinea, and you know, many of the largest countries in Latin America. His objection was having a Soviet satellite. He didn't want to have that, in, particularly in the Western Hemisphere. But he believed that people should be able to experiment with different kinds of governments, and that they would collapse from their own inefficiencies if they didn't work after a period of time. But that if the American, if America got involved, it would not only fortify those tyrannies, because it would it would radicalize them against us and give them an outside en enemy, which is what tyrannies love. That's the only thing that holds them together is an outside force. My grandfather said that for many, many years. That we needed to stay out of other people's business and let them settle their own. It was against American values to go, you know, to other countries and try to change their governments. So, I think today we now have a problem because I think President Trump has not only brought this country into disrepute around the globe, but he's also brought and to disrepute the entire American experience with self-governance. Because if you're, if you're in China, I do a lot of business in China. 
the smartest people in China are, are the people who are running the country. Even the, the lower officials and the provincial governments, the deputies, are, are the people. You know, who we knew at school who had 180 IQs. They're like, you know, they're really, really smart people and they're well informed and they read books and they understand problems and they're constantly trying to solve them. They don't always solve them the way that we want, but they're thinking and they're thoughtful, deep, profound people. And if you live in China today and you're looking at what's happening in the United States, why would you ever say, we want to switch our system for that system, which can produce you know, that kind of buffoonery at a high level, produce a series of presidents who don't read books. You know? <laughs> Um, why would you do that? Why would any country do that? Well, the only way that the United States is going to be able to spread democracy in the future is at the barrel of a gun, you know, because we're not being able, we're not able to do it by example. If democracy produces this kind of leadership, why would anybody go for it? And I think President Trump is is purposefully um, and and systematically encouraging tyrannical governments around the world, but he's also encouraging it by the example of, you know, what a disaster democracy has become. Hmm. You mentioned uh, Cuba and Castro, and as I read your retelling of the events of the Bay of Pigs, there seems to be a strong hinting that, and maybe more than that, that you believe that JFK was in a sense, deceived into giving the order to go ahead with the Bay of Pigs. Is that a fair statement? Well, look, I don't think there's any question of that. I don't think anybody historically, even Dulles, said that you know it smelled bad from him from the beginning, that they had to lie to him. He was only, the Bay of Pigs was planned by Richard Nixon, and who was in charge of the program. He called it his brainchild. And he was vice president at the time, but they left it for President Kennedy to implement. And they had trained all these, you know, 2,000 um, Cuban troops in Guatemala, Nicaragua, Florida, and Louisiana. And they were armed and trained, and they were ready to go. And um, Jack Kennedy did not want the United States involved, and he didn't want to even be involved in any way. In fact, he would not allow the U.S. Navy to transport them. They ended up landing in Cuba on United Fruit boats, ships, ships that were provided by the United Fruit Company, which um, Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles used to run. You know, they were chief counsel to United Fruit. And, um, United Fruits lands had been nationalized in Cuba by Castro. And uh, so he, President Kennedy did not want any involvement. But one of the things that he told General Lemonster and Alan Dulles repeatedly is that he did not want US fingerprints on this he, because he, he thought it, we would look like bullies to the rest of the world if we were going in and changing a government, doing regime change. That's not what America does. We don't do regime change in this country. We let countries decide their own futures and their own destinies. We don't do that for them. He thought that would hurt us in, I, across the Americas, but also it would very, be very damaging around the world. So oh, they, they knew, and they told him that as soon as the Bay of Pigs uh, Troop Brigade 2506 lands, there's going to be an uprising against Castro, which my uncle was skeptical of, but he believed the CIA intelligence. But they were lying to him. They knew that Castro at that time was extremely popular in Cuba, uh, that he had an army and an intelligence apparatus that was very, very well trained, and that. Um, at, and they were landing the Bay of Pigs uh, brigade in a place where there was no opportunity to establish. It wasn't like the Sierra Madre in the western end of Cuba. It was a place, it was a swamp where you could not um, hide. There was no place to hide. So what they believed was that, what Lemonster and Dulles believed was that as soon as the a, a pig's invasion got in trouble, then my uncle would chicken out, 
would want to avoid humiliation and would send in the U.S. Navy, the Essex, which he said, and in fact, when he walked out of the first meeting, he said, I want to, I want to take the CIA, I want to shatter it into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. And he said, they thought, Alan Dulles thought I would call in the Essex, which was the aircraft carrier, and, um, it, and I would chicken out and call in the Essex, and they didn't know who they were dealing with. So I don't think historically there's, um, there's any question that President Kennedy was, um, you know, was thought it was very, very reluctant to do that. One of the things they, the CIA told him is, if we don't do it, if we don't send them over there, we don't know what we're going to do with these Cubans because they're violent. We're going to have to bring them back here, and they're going to cause a lot of problems. And um, not only are you going to look, you know, like you're soft on communism, but these people are are very, very dangerous people. And um, and that's, you know, those were the kind of arguments that they were using at the time. That's an eye-opener, isn't it? I want to talk about your father, and one of the themes that runs so heavily through your book, one of the values, if you will, is that of service, starting with your grandfather and on through the family. And I was watching just the other night the Netflix documentary, Bobby Kennedy for President. And uh, one of the stories I was not aware of was his trip to Mississippi. Uh, Marion Wright Edelman challenged him to see poverty in the United States firsthand, and he made the trip there and to other places as well to see staggering poverty. And the story is told that he came home from that trip and challenged all of you as a result of that. Do you remember that? Yeah. And do you remember what he said to you all about that? It, well, he had seen, you know, these, um, he, he was shocked to find that there was people who were literally starving in our country, that there were kids with the, the red, um, reddish hair of malnutrition, that they had rickets, they had swollen bellies, like you would see in, um, you know, in Africa, but not, but it was in the Mississippi Delta, and vacant eyes, and he came home when, from that night, from his trip to the Delta, and he came home to us in the dining room, and he said that he had been in a, a home that day where there were two families living in a home that was smaller than our dining room and that there was only one meal a day of rice and that the children went to bed hungry. And he said to us that when we grew older that he wanted to make sure that we spent our lives making sure that that didn't happen in America. Yeah, yeah the, the person who told the story in the documentary said that he said to all of you, you've, you've got to do something about yeah. this. Yeah. Um, in addition to that documentary, there's, there's been just such a fascination with your family. 50, 55, 60 years after all of these events took place. Um, of course, you know the movie Chappaquiddick is in theaters right now. Have you seen the movie? Have you heard about the movie? What are your thoughts about it? No, I, um, I wouldn't watch that movie. I wouldn't, not not because it's about a, a, you know, a very difficult subject. That was a very, very, that was probably the lowest point in my family's history um, and challenged, I think, a lot of the ways that we saw each other and caused a lot of dissension in my family for that lasted a long time. Um, but uh, uh, I wouldn't go to see uh, dramatizations in general about my family because, I mean, I would watch a documentary, particularly if it was going to tell me something new. Uh, to, uh, the dramatizations are always, you know, they're, they're movies and they're, um, and they're not historically correct and, they, and the characters are one-dimensional and, you know, it's just the nature of filmmaking that um, it, I've, I've almost never seen anybody actually capture, you know, the, 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 the depth and the three-dimensionalness of um, people in my family who I knew. You know, it's always kind of a caricature, and it's, uh, it's kind of irritating, and uh, so I wouldn't, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I, I, the, the ones that are complimentary, you know, the ones I wouldn't, they did one on Jackie last year, and I just wouldn't watch. I can't. I can only take about ten seconds before I <laughs> turn it off. So. 
So there was another one on CNN that you were featured in on several nights. What did you think about that one? That was pretty I recent. I don't think anybody in my family particularly liked it. I only watched the first um, episode and saw how they, that it was unfair. You know, they, one of the things CNN did, I thought it was not like, you know, disaster. And I think they were trying, but they were, they, um, they, they were, they were doing something that, again, is irritating, which is to they constantly putting thoughts into people's heads. You know, that uh, I, I remember the, in the first one, they said that my Uncle Joe Kennedy joined the service because he was jealous of his brother, my, of Jack, who was a war hero because of PT-109. In reality, my Uncle Joe, and that, you know, that he went on a suicidal mission because he was so intent on, you know, on rivaling his brother. There's no evidence for any of that. In fact, Joe joined the service two years before PT-109 went down. So it just, and, and they said that my grandfather um, gave a lobotomy to my aunt, uh, Rosemary, because he was embarrassed by her, but my, 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 my grandfather, my grandmother were so proud of Rosemary, and they did something that at the time was almost unheard of, which was to keep her at home. They, in fact, um, not only, you know, um, included her in every event, but they, uh, they presented her to the Queen at Buckingham Palace. And, uh, you know, she had a profound intellectual disability, but they thought that that was not something that um, degraded her value, diminished her value as a human being. So, um, they, you know, all of the, and they consistently in that film in, make interpretations that kind of put the worst uh, motives to every event. And I've seen that stuff before, and mm -hmm. I've heard it, and I don't, you know, so I, I guess I regret participating in it, but you never know. Hmm. Who knows? Well, as I watched the Netflix documentary, I was so struck by your father's travels, um, the many, many people that he encountered and how he just went out and met people all over the country and all over the world. And there was so much that I learned from that about him that I didn't know. And I was struck by what we lost. And I wonder, as you think about it, had he lived and gone on almost certainly to be president of the United States, how do you think he might have changed the course of this nation? Well, I think that they, you know, my father's death was one of the traumas, along with President Kennedy's and the Vietnam War and the, um, and 9-11 ultimately that has put each one of those traumas pushed this country further and further along a path to becoming a national security state and more of a oligarchy and um, uh, an imperium and more, more of a plutocracy um, uh, um, instead of democracy. My uncle, uh, President Kennedy, Three months before his death, signed a national security order 237, ordering the removal of all troops, all American troops from Vietnam by the end of 1965. And at that, and the thing that prompted him is he learned on that morning that there had been 75 Americans killed. He never allowed ground troops into Vietnam, despite you know all the tremendous pressure from the entire national security establishment. He sent less true, he, he sent advisors, Green Berets, to Vietnam. Um, in the end, there was 16,000, which are fewer people than he sent to Ole Miss to get James Meredith ad admitted to Ole Miss. Um, his advisors were saying that they needed 250,000 up to 500,000. Yeah, and they needed to be combat troops capable of independent action, and he refused. And then he learned that 75 Americans had been killed, and he was horrified. He said, we're getting out. He signed National Security Order 237, all troops to be gone from Vietnam by the end of 1965. Two weeks after his death, Johnson said, I'm not going to be the president to lose Vietnam, and, um, and revoked at national security order. So my uncle would have ended Vietnam. 
My father ran for one reason, to end Vietnam. If he had won, we would have gotten out and we would have gone a different direction. But all of those, their deaths, ensure that the military got more and more powerful and that we became more, you know, more, we forced, we went down the road more and more towards a, a militarism that has now become the hallmark of, you know, of the American century. Um, and those traumas, you know, um, they were, and, and, and I would include 9-11, uh, each one of those pushes us further and further down that road. You know, I, you were talking about my father's travels, and I'll tell you a story that, you know, is in the book that's, that, you know, I, I, people like to hear, which is, my father brought, uh, my uncle, one of the, one of the, um, the things that really turned the CIA against my uncle was he gave this speech, a very famous speech in 1956, about Africa should be ruled by the Africans, and the, the liberal establishment included, led by Adlai Stevenson, opposed him and condemned him for that. And the Republicans, Nelson Rockefeller, Barry Goldwater, Richard Nixon, also condemned him. Because at that time, Europe was viewed as the bulwark against communist expansion, and we needed to support our NATO allies who were trying to hold on to their colonial empires abroad. Um, but when I've traveled in Africa and Latin America and in, in the Arab countries, people today in the United States, nobody remembers that speech. But I've met literally thousands of people in those countries during my lifetime whose name is Kennedy because he made that speech and because of the Peace Corps and because of the Food for Children program. If you measure a it's difficult measuring the success of a presidency, but you know, and people do it by polling or by talking to polling historians, but probably one of the ways to measure it is um, if you measure it based upon the popularity of the president abroad, there's probably no more successful presidency in American history than John Kennedy's. And you know, in virtually every capital, in Latin America and Africa and most of the capitals in Asia, there's a boulevard named for my uncle. There's hospitals and schools and, uh, and monuments and parks named after him. And that's not true of other presidents. As Kennedy used to say, that there are children in Africa whose name is Lincoln, Jefferson, and Washington, but there's none who are named Marx or Lenin. And he was proud of that. And he would be very, very proud that there are so many kids all over the world named after him and that, you know, his picture can still be found in huts in Africa and in Latin America and on Indian reservations here. Uh, he, he, was on the, he was the head of the African subcommittee in the United States Senate and very interested in Africa. And my father brought home a video of Africa, or a, a film of Africa, a 16 millimeter film when I was probably about seven years old and called Africa Speaks. He showed it in our basement and I became obsessed with Africa at that age. And I would wait for National Geographic and Life magazine to arrive so I could read about Africa. And I read the White Nile and the Blue Nile. My mother read it to me. Um, and then in 1959, we got a visit, or 60, 1960, in the summer, we got a visit from an African leader at our home. And for me, it was the most exciting day of my life to meet this guy. His name was Tom Mboya. And he had been one of the leaders of the Mau Mau in um, Kenya. He was a labor leader. He had one year of Oxford. He'd written a dissertation about democracy in Africa. His heroes were Gandhi and Thomas Jefferson. And he, he had been kind of a partner. He was from the smallest tribe in Kenya, which is called the Luau tribe. It's a fish-eating tribe up on Lake Victoria. And they're known as very smart and peacemakers. He was partners with Jomo Kenyatta, who was a Kikuyu, and who I also met you know, when I went to Africa when I was a little boy, when I eventually went. And, um, and the Mau Mau finally 
wore down the British, and they said, in 1959, they said, we're going to give you five years, and we're going to leave, and then you're going to have to run your own government. And Amboya looked around and said, in the entire country, there's not one black African with a college degree. How are we going to run this country? So he wrote letters to all the colleges in the United States asking them to provide scholarships for Kenyan kids, and he would select the smartest kids in Kenya. 200 colleges gave full scholarships, including Harvard. And, but he realized in mid-1960, the summer of 1960, they were going to start in September, and he realized that they didn't have money to bring them over here. And he needed $100,000. He flew over on a very urgent mission, and he visited the State Department, but it was in the middle of the campaign between Nixon and my uncle. And Nixon thought that the South, the black vote was then up for grabs between Republicans and Democrats. Nixon thought it would injure him in the South to, if, if you know, he was seen to be bringing 200 black kid, people to America, um, and so he stopped the State Department from funding Mboya's project. And Mboya met with Martin Luther King, who said, you should go to John Kennedy because he, he loves Africa. And he introduced Mboya to Harry Belafonte, Calypso Singer, who was very close to my family and who was funding at that time the civil rights movement. Um, and Harry Belafonte brought him up to the Cape that summer. And I got to meet him, boy. My uncle fell in love with him. He was, he was this incredibly dynamic, charming, charismatic man. And the Kennedy Foundation could not help him because the Kennedy Foundation was restricted to giving money for intellectual disabilities. But my uncle gave his own money, $200,000 bring these kids over, but with the proviso that Amboya not tell anybody about it, wow. because he knew it would be used against him in the election. Nixon found out about it and branded the project the Kennedy airlift and made a big um, uh, you know, press conferences, et cetera, about it. So in 1963, I went to Africa with my uncle. I finally got to go. My uncle, Sarge Driver, who was running the Peace Corps, his son was my best friend. And we went to Kenya and Tanzania and spent a lot of time with Tom Mboya. And in 1968, when my father was killed on June 6th, all of the elder kids in our family were dispersed so that my mother would be able to spend time with the younger children and kind of get her life organized. So my brother Joe was sent to uh, to be a guide on Mount Rainier with the climber Jim Whitaker, who was close to my family. My sister Kathleen was sent to work with the Eskimos in Alaska. My brother David went to work for Cesar Chavez in Arizona, or in uh, Delano, in California. And I got to, be, got to go to Africa for the summer, and I spent a lot of that summer with Tom and Boya. And I spent till August in Africa, the following August, the following, or in September, the following September, um, Amboya was assassinated. Mm. He was the um, he was the president, and he would have been the, the successor to to, uh, to Kenyatta, who I had met on those trips. Mm. But um, Kenyatta, but Daniel Arap Moy had thugs assassinate him and Moy became president and turned Kenya kind of into a dictatorship. Wow. Um, in 2004, I was living with Larry David on um, Martha's Vineyard with the comedian. <laughs> who, and I lived with him for two years out there. And uh, he eventually, that was when he was writing Seinfeld. But, um, and he eventually would introduce me to my wife, Cheryl Hines, who plays his wife on Curb Your Enthusiasm. And, um, but he didn't know Cheryl then, and neither did I. And we were on, on Martha's Vineyard, and I was asked to come to, uh, to Boston, where the Democratic Convention is, to give the, the keynote speech on the environment. 
oh, Larry and I flew up there and we got floor passes and we spent the day at the convention. We had a really great time. And, um, and then I gave my speech and after I spoke, a young first term senator from Illinois who nobody had ever heard of, um, <laughs> who was, had only been in office for a little over a year and uh, Barack Obama gave this extraordinary convention speech that would propel him four years later to the Democratic nomination. But it was the first that anybody had ever heard of him and we got to spend time in the green room with um, Barack and he said that he was, he told us that he was going to Martha's Vineyard so we rode down with him. Um, he was going to Oaks Bluff, which is a black community, very wealthy black community on the vineyard. And he was going down there to do a fundraiser and we ate dinner with him that night. And while we were at, at dinner, I was asking him about his, himself and he told me that his father was Kenyan. And I said, oh, what tribe, do you know what tribe he was from? And he said he was Luau. And I said, I said, wow, have you ever heard of Tom and Boya? And he said to me, Tom and Boya is the reason I'm in this country, because his father was the first kid brought over on that airlift. Oh. Um, wow. <laughs> we just need to let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> Thank you for coming to Philadelphia. Would you discuss the catalyst that changed your father from working for Senator Joseph McCarthy to the man that he was running for president in 1968? Yeah, I mean, that's an, an interesting question, and I talk about that in the book a lot, um, because McCarthy was, um, McCarthy was a Catholic. He was the most powerful Catholic in Washington at that time and extraordinarily popular with Catholics. In fact, one of the reasons, and he became friends with my grandfather when he was young, before he was doing the um, House on american Activities Committee, before he really went crazy. But he was, he was a very, like most Catholics at that time, he was very strong anti-communist. And he, um, which my, you know, my family was too. So, oh, and which basically all Catholics were. They thought, you know, Catholics at that time saw communism as the, the you know, antithesis of, of um, you know, of their, all of their beliefs. So oh, McCarthy, and McCarthy could, when my uncle ran against Lodge in 56, um, he was running against a very popular incumbent senator. He was given almost no chance of winning. And if McCarthy had come into the state, he would have lost. Because of his friendship with my grandfather, McCarthy didn't come into the state. Um, and he came, McCarthy came to the Cape to visit my uncles and aunts. He was extremely charming. He had been a war hero. Um, he was a boxer at Marquette, so he was very tough. And he impressed them a lot because he would, he was reckless in the way that he played football and they, you know, played touch with him and then he didn't know how to swim. But my family has this thing where they put a rope behind the sailboat and then everybody jumps in the water and lets the sailboat and he jumped in anyway and he almost drowned but he was a very good sport about it. So they liked him a lot. And, uh, and then when he started the committee my father had just gotten out of law school and, uh, and my father and my grandfather said, well, why don't you get a job for him? So he went to interview for him uh, as chief counsel. And McCarthy gave the job to, to Roy Cohn. And my father, he hired my father and my father were, hated Cohn from the beginning because he saw what kind of man Cohn was. And, he, my father worked on, a, on an investigation which really was, I think, the beginning of, you know, he became probably the, the most important investigator in this country. He was like Mueller is today. 
he was, uh, you know, his investigations of the mob and they were thorough and they were diligent and they were, you know, they, he was over prepared for them. And, and he did an investigation of, um, of U.S. corporations that were uh, violating the Trading with the Enemy Act during um, the Korean War and who were, you know, trading with, with Red China and selling arms and, and supplies to our enemies. And, um, and he ultimately, his investigation resulted in a series of, conditions of, of convictions. He stayed away from the other stuff McCarthy was doing. And at that time, McCarthy was talking anti-communism, but he wasn't, doing, he wasn't doing the kind of stuff that he ended up doing, um, ruining people's lives and you know, on no evidence. And, and um, my father, uh, because of his relationship with Cohn, after six months, his investigation was completed. He left the committee. He came back on the minority side of the committee as chief counsel to Senator McClellan. And in that position, he ended up writing the censor agreement that eventually censored McCarthy and brought McCarthy down. So he was one of the leaders of that effort. He. He liked McCarthy, and he felt sorry for him, and he felt that McCarthy was a, a you know, McCarthy was a demagogue. He was kind of, he was a, a heavy drinking, bon homme, kind of, you know, big friendly, nice guy like Tony Soprano, you know, <laughs> who you would like if you saw him. But um, he was also, had, he didn't have proper boundaries, and he was, and Cohn, who was a very evil man, was able to um, play on his worst sides. My father always had an affection for McCarthy and saw that he was, um, uh, you know, that he had a good side that had just been lost. When McCarthy died, um, and all, all by that time, all, everybody. I, who was liberal in this country was condemning him. My father went to his funeral um, just because he thought it was the right thing to do. Um, and, you know, just in memory of that old friendship. So my father, when he was asked about McCarthy, he would always just say simply, he wouldn't give the long explanation. He would just always say, I made a mistake. Um, but, you know, his mistake in truth, was not ever in getting involved with chasing non-existent communists in the State Department and in the, you know Hollywood, et cetera. He was never part of any of that. In fact, he was long gone before McCarthy started doing that. His mistake was just in getting involved with in misjudging McCarthy's character and getting involved with him at all in the beginning. Uh, can you speak to the roots of your environmental philosophy and activism in your in your from your family perspective? You know, I the question was about my environmental activism. I work, I you know, I started my environmental. First of all, I was, I always was interested in the outdoors from when I was very very little. From when I was born, my mother says that I would look at bugs when I was in the crib. <laughs> and I started, um, and I was always involved with wildlife, and I started racing homing pigeons when I was seven years old, you know, very seriously. And um, I was actually sending homers down to Philadelphia to fly back to Virginia um, on the train, you know, that's how we would raise them. And then I got involved training hawks when I was nine years old, and I've, I've been a falconer ever since. And I, I breed hawks, and I, um, I have want to run a re for many years ran a rehabilitation um, facility at my home uh, for wild raptors. I banned them for the Fish and Wildlife Service, but I've always train hawks, and I, I wrote um, the exam that people take um, to become a falconer, um, it, you know, because the law regulates it very, very strictly. So I, I've always been involved in that, but I was involved also, love water from when I was young, and I made a trip to president. I wrote it, my uncle a letter when he was in the White House talk, complaining about pollution and asking if I could come see him, and then I went in with a 
a salamander, and there's a story about that in the book. It's crazy. <laughs> but I went to work for a group of commercial fishermen in, um, in uh, 1984 and, uh, and began suing polluters on the Hudson for the commercial fishermen. And, and that movement has expanded. We have a patrol boat we launched on the Hudson called the River Keeper, and now you know, we successfully brought f over 500 lawsuits, um, forced polluters to spend five and a half billion dollars. And today, the Hudson is the richest waterway in the North Atlantic. It produces more pounds of fish per acre, more biomass per gallon than any other waterway in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and the miraculous resurrection of Hudson, Hudson inspired the creation of now we have 350 river keepers, including here on the Delaware River. We have patrol, each one has a patrol boat, um, and each one has a full time paid water keeper. And we sue polluters, we do law enforcement, and we're doing it now. We're in 42 countries with the fastest growing water protection group in the world. So that's kind of the brief story. <laughs> So I'm of an age where my values and beliefs and character were, I think, for the most part, shaped by watching your family and your father in particular, and especially about the nobility of service. And my question to you is, who gives you hope and inspiration now? <laughs> the Pope. I, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, listen, I'm very excited about the number of women who are running for political <laughs> office. You know, which is really unprecedented. So, uh, you know, I think there's still, uh, there's a tremendous amount of people, and I hope it's the majority of people in our country who still, you know, hold on to that idealistic view of America. And, um, you know, even when you, you, um, when you start talking to um, Republicans, I, you know, I, I did an environmental, I did a, I've been a, talking, lecturing about the environment for years. Um, and I was doing about 60 speeches a year, like paid speeches to big audiences, a couple thousand people. And I would, uh, most of the speeches I was getting for some odd reason, were in red states. Um, they were in mainly, maybe because my family was at like a novelty or just like a scary thing or whatever. I don't know why, but they really, you know, I would end up a lot in Texas and Kansas and, um, and I would get standing, I would, you know, be, um, you know, talk about the environment in ways that I think, you know, everybody can understand, but I got uh, standing ovations at virtually every speech that I gave, and on the environment, um, and uh, I it really struck me as odd because um, I mean I started thinking that you know 80 percent of Republicans are just Democrats who don't know what's going on, who aren't paying attention, <laughs> and. You know, I think a lot of it is people really aren't paying attention. I was in Alabama two weeks ago, and I was in a, you know, driving from Huntsville to Birmingham. And you know that AM dial is all right-wing talk, right? It's, it's completely, there's nothing uh, progressive or liberal. But in Alabama, the, the FM dial is also 100% right-wing talks. So there's five stations, and all of them are extremely, really like poisonous racial stuff—stuff stuff that you would not, you know, believe was happening in America. And there's one NPR station. Of course, public radio is not liberal. It's just, you know, neutral. It's just truth, right? And, and uh, <laughs> so, but it's not, you know, it's not. Um, deliberately progressive or liberal. There are stations like Tom Hartman who are like, who do that, you know, deliberately liberal stuff. NPR doesn't do that, it's very innocuous to most people, but in NPR in Alabama, it only plays 
classical music. <laughs> well, people aren't even getting that, and they're literally just getting this barrage of this right-wing insanity all the time, this hate stuff, and demagog all the alchemies of demagoguery. And, you know, I think uh, there's a lot of a lot of decent people, but those rural red states are really they, they take over the media by Clear Channel and you know some of these other big outfits has really um, wounded something basic in the American psyche, um, and you know that we have to figure out a way to reclaim. My question regards the relationship between your dad and LBJ, and any insight you may have to private conversations they may have. I know there were not, there was no love lost between them. You know, it was a complicated relationship and um, it's, you know, a lot of people say when well, my father didn't want LBJ um, to be on the ticket and that that's where, uh, you know, and that he tried to talk LBJ out of it. But really, that was a misunderstanding at that time. It was much more complex than that. It, my, my father, you know, my uncle said, we're going to do LBJ, and my father was on board with that. He, 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 they were approached at that time by the unions who said, if you bring LBJ on the AFL-CIO, George Meany and all those guys, and the UAW, Walter Reuter, said to my father and uncle, if you choose LBJ, we are going to turn against the ticket. Well, my uncle had um, said, my uncle said to my father, you know, go down and tell Lyndon that this is what we're getting, so he knows what he's getting into. But, he, but Lyndon, when my father had that conversation with him, felt that my father was trying to talk him out of the job, which he wasn't. He was just saying, here's what's going to happen. You know, these guys are, um, you know, but, but Johnson was regarded as a right-wing Southerner at that time. He's not the Johnson that we remember him, you know, today. So the unions hated him, and he was from a non-union state and had voted non-union, and the unions were the backbone of the Democratic Party then, and they hated him. Oh, and my father was just conveying a political reality to him. But I think Lyndon um, was, uh, um, you know, felt that it was a personal. And when um, when my uncle was uh, killed, and my father, there was a lot of tension after his, immediately following his death, which happened in Texas, you know, on a trip that was um, that was sort of Lyndon's trip, um, and the way that the transition was handled at the time, my father was, you know, extremely wounded and, and damaged at that time, and, and was, and, and I think more tensions arose. But having said that. Johnson did some really nice things for my father. Um, he, he knew my father was really um, struggling. And he started sending him on trips. And he sent him to Indonesia to meet the Sukarno, and to, which my father ended up um, uh, solving a, a problem that would have probably otherwise evolved into a, a war. Um, at that time, but it, it, well, those trips were important for kind of bringing my father back um, and allowing him to sort of re-engage. When I was little at that time in uh, 64, I injured myself and, and uh, I went through a window. I, I jumped off a roof and went through a window and I ended up c cutting off a couple of my toes, which they sewed back on. So. <laughs> and uh, almost severing my foot. And Johnson wrote me a long, long letter at that time, a very, very sweet letter, which I have. Um, but, you know, by Vietnam and the Alliance for Progress really drove a uh, stake through the heart of that relationship. So my father was really, was thinking of, of um, becoming vice president, you know, he would have run for vice president if Johnson had asked him. But, but the Alliance for Progress, when my Johnson, you know, my uncle was trying to um, 
change the U.S. relationship with Latin America instead of supporting the military dictatorships to support left-wing democracies that would um, do social reform, and Johnson reversed that, brought in a terrible guy called Thomas Mann, who was a CIA guy, and, um, and my father con yeah. considered that an act of war against the Kennedy legacy. And then Vietnam really destroyed the relationship. And my father was talking to Johnson about Vietnam, about disengaging from Vietnam um, within a few months of my uncle's death in 64. By 65, he was um, openly, uh, you know, after the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, when we actually became, you know, it became our war, and we started carpet bombing, my father was um, utterly repulsed by that and felt that that was, you know, something that the Nazis would do, to bomb civilian populations and to bomb the dams and dikes. And he, it was, uh, it was antithetical to everything he believed in. And he, could, he began confronting Johnson more and more. And there's the story of his ultimate confrontation, I think, is one of the high points of that book. And I, you know, I was kind of peripherally involved in it because um, I had an animal called a Kodamundi that um, attacked my mother that that morning uh, when he was going to make his speech in the Senate, and it sent my mother into premature labor. And uh, a lot of weird things happened that day because of the Kodamundi. But you'll have to get the book and read it. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the book is called American Values, Lessons I Learned from My Family. You can see why it is such a fascinating read. Please join me in thanking Robert F. Kennedy, Jr. for being with us tonight. Thank you all for coming.